process of like taking the the rib, the closest thing to the heart, and creating wow. a woman and like the symbiotic nature. So he would be good to talk about that, like the Amazing. symbiotic nature of, of man and woman. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode today. I am super excited to be speaking with the man, the myth, the legend, Charlie Kirk. Welcome to the show. Hello, Candace. I, I love this. <laughs> Do you love this? Congratulations, Thank first you. of all. This Thank is amazing. You. This is like my own little cave. I, I Yes, the cave of freedom. Yes, the cave of freedom. <laughs> oh, we have so much to unpack. People were super excited to write in questions. Of I basically posted on Instagram, if there is anything that you've ever wanted to ask Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens, what would it be? And tons of, I got over 22,000 responses. Wow. It was yeah. like an AMA in it real was, time. Yeah, it was, it was insane. And my favorite, by the way, my first. My, this, my, I, I, here it comes. <laughs> my favorite question that I got was, who is Charlie Kirk? <laughs> well, so uh, you know what? I'm going to take that in the more metaphorical way. Like, tell me the soul of Charlie. I'm going to pretend like they didn't know who I was. <laughs> right? So yeah. just for self-confidence purposes, but it is, like, it's a tell good, me who the real Charlie Kirk is. No, I'm it's a good place to start, to start, though, because a lot of people don't know how you ended up here. People were asking me where you went to undergrad. And, yes. and I said, wow, people don't actually know I went know to Prager University, Prager actually. Prager University. That's where I went. Best school. The best, the best school. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, um, what a treat it is to be here. Awesome. And you're, you're doing amazing, as always. Um, so who am I? I'm from Chicago. I'm 25 years old. Luckiest 25-year-old, I think, in the country. Um, started Turning Point USA when I was 18. Why? Um, I felt like we were losing our country. And I still feel like in some way we are. I think we've made some good changes over the last couple of years. Um, and I saw in my local community, my high school, students that would be inherently conservative, something similar to kind of what we always talk about, but they would never use that word. Um, they believed in hard work. They believed in the country, but they would also just all of a sudden automatically identify as liberals right. and as people on the left. And that bothered me. And I was always a more conservative, patriotic, um, unusual high school kid, I guess you could say, that would <laughs> read um, every historical political book possible and, you know, have, you know, debates and dialogue and, you, with my teachers. Of course, Charlie would be debating with his high school teachers um, is what all my friends would say. Anyway, um, started this. I had no money, no experience, no connections and no idea what I was doing, but um, took a little risk in June of 2012. And here we are now. And, you know, you and I have been working now for what? Together a year and a couple months. That's and right. it's just been amazing. And you've contributed tremendously and greatly from taking Turning Point from one level to just an exponential level higher. And well, let's, take it, let's actually take it back because there sure. could be people that are watching this that actually don't know what Turning Point USA is. Oh, wow. okay. And I think it's really important that, sure. that we explain what it is that Turning Point does and why it's necessary right now in this country, sure. especially as we're talking about launching as we have Turning Point UK. Yes. Um, so for those that don't know, Turning Point USA, um, we're a nationwide student activist movement um, present on 1,400 high school and college campuses across the country. Um, in short, the mission statement is to educate, empower, and organize students around three really big ideas, that America is the greatest country ever to exist, that the Constitution is the greatest political document ever written, and free enterprise capitalism is the most moral, proven, and effective economic system ever discovered. Those are the three really overarching themes. Um, and even more simply, um, we believe that we're in the midst of a culture war. This is something that Prager University and yourself and Dennis, we all agree that the stakes could not be higher of these ideas and the consequence of whether people believe in them or not. Because if we have an identity crisis as a country and we can no longer agree that we live in a great country, that country will cease to exist. Well, here's what's interesting. So everything that you just said, empowering and educating students, doesn't really sound that controversial. Mm -hmm. If I Google Charlie Kirk and I get hits back, you sound pretty controversial. Yes. Right? I've, I've, I've seen articles saying that you support white supremacy. You're not doing a good job, by the way. Hiring me was probably Can not you good. vouch that I'm not a white... Can we put it on the record, I'll Candace? just say you're not doing a good job. Of it, okay. Yeah? You're okay. You're sucking at it really badly, okay? <laughs> so it says that, that, that you support Nazis, that your group, and especially with this, this launch and moving overseas, yes. that you're bringing this darkness to Europe. So darkness, yeah. Why is that the interpretation if, if what you're looking to do is talk about conservative principles? It sure. shouldn't be that complicated. Well, it's intentional demagoguery by the left. Um, instead of trying to have discussion or debate or dialogue and say, Charlie is incorrect about these things, it's much easier to defame people. Right. Um, because, look, there, there's an understandable amount of fear in America over the last 50, 60 years of radical voices. I'm not trying to dismiss that. Like, there's actual people that should be dismissed, such as David Duke. Like, there's bad people out there. Um 
But it's easier for the left to be able to say Charlie's a bad person than Charlie is incorrect. Right. And unfortunately, there's an entire political party built around this. There's an entire part of the American political discourse that is built around this entire um, viewpoint, which is to defame, demagogue, and discredit instead of disprove. Right. And that's such a sad indictment of our country, isn't it? Because it, it, it wouldn't be that, like, oh, Charlie is mistaken on free market economics as of why. Instead, it's you're a terrible person, you're this and you're that. And um, the idea is to not allow people like you and I to even get to the campuses. Exactly. And the truth is, it's because they know that if people hear us, they might agree. How many times, Candace, <laughs> how many times, and for your audience to know, Candace uh, serves communication director of Turning Point USA. Um, came on our team in November and has just been so amazing and so instrumental in so many different ways. And we've done how many campus events? Countless. Countless. countless yeah, countless yeah. events and campus events together. And how many times, Candace, did we go on campus and there was that student that said, I'll never forget it. So they always say the same thing one way or the other. You're a lot different than I was told you were going to be. Right. I mean, they, so they'll show up and, and they've got, you know, the Black Lives Matter protesters <laughs> sitting in. At sitting, UCLA, seated, for example. Yeah, seated in the front row, you know, arms crossed. And then you've got your Antifa people that are planning some weird event. And, and there's people that are yes. just all over trying to disrupt. And they, they come with an idea. I don't know what they're expecting for us to get on stage and say white power and to salute Nazis and, and to do something terrible. And then they hear us speak. And, and my whole thing is, hey, if you're black, I believe in you. Yes. We can do it without government handouts. This is why we need to embrace conservative principles. This is how liberal principles and policies have failed us in the past six years. I believe in you. We can do this as a community. And their faces over time are just like, why did I hate this person? That's right. My favorite moment is because some students are programmed, almost um, it's rehearsed by their professors to hate us. And so they come in, and as UCLA, I'll never forget this, Candace, you said, I believe in you as a group of black students. I believe in you. I think you can succeed without government. I think you can all be rich and wealthy. And one of the students essentially got up to the microphone and was like, stop believing in me. Essentially, <laughs> like, no, no, I'm actually like trying to make your life better. Like, right. No, stop it. I want to be a victim. Right. It, it, the, the absurdity of resistance, of right. empowerment. Um, well, the left has done a number on confidence, and that's what I say in the black community. The worst thing that they've done to to the black community is they they stripped away our sense of self confidence. Yes, and there was a sense of self confidence. You know, I speak about my grandfather all the time growing up on a sharecropping farm, and he did it, man. Like he did it from start yes. to finish. He grew He's up an in American a segregated hero with what he did. South. Your Prager U video he, talked about right. It. Yes. He never said he never talked about racism. He never said I can't do something because I'm black. He never said that society was stopping him. He just kept his head down and he worked his entire li life, and he had had conservative principles. He married my grandmother. He stayed married to her until his until her dying day in 2013. And that was the example that I had in my life. And now we have these kids who have lived through nothing. No, no, they, they, they have no adversity they whatsoever. They, they can't. They can't do anything. Of course not. My skin's black. I'm a woman. I'm I'm gay. I'm lesbian. I'm trans. I can't do anything in this society. And the left has programmed them with all of these excuses. And it's actually those excuses that are cancerous to their progress. That's right. And for the audience to understand this, Candace has been the most effective voice at at challenging the victimhood narrative. Because the way, unfortunately, the pyramid exists I, as a white Christian male that's straight and grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, I'm not allowed to talk about this stuff. I mean, obviously I am, but they don't take it seriously. But as a black female who used to be a liberal that grew up in poverty and went through a tremendous amount of adversity in your life, all of a sudden they can't discredit you. Right. And when they do, they look like they look Fools. like Looney Tunes. Right. And, and you're, 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 <laughs> they are Looney Tunes. No, that, that's exactly right. You know, I get to the, I get to the are, yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm being very nice by the term Looney Tune, right. by the way. <laughs> I'm watching you, Democrat Socialists of America, <laughs> doing your opposition research. Um, <laughs> I'm watching you. Um, but the, 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 you're so effective at it because if they dare challenge you and they come on a college campus and they say, Candace, I'm super oppressed. You could be you basically say, okay, if we want to have the oppression Olympics. I'm going like, to win. I'm going to win. Gold gonna medal. Win. Don't triathlete. Do don't do I, it. You, you are the Jesse Owens of oppression Olympics, yes. right? Being Candace Related Owens. Related to him, by right? the way. There you go. Yes, I am. And I'm telling I, you, they don't, they don't want to play that game with no. me. And so, but they the media then tries to effectively combat that by just smearing me mm -hmm. so they won't even get in the room to hear me. Because right. they might. They might. If they come here, Candace Owens speak, have the audacity to believe in themselves when they walk out of the room. Right. And, and imagine if we had a country where more people thought they could do it and someone doesn't have to do it for them. Right. And, and isn't that what has made America the most resilient country ever? 
That, that's how we've been able to incorporate people from all over the world, all different backgrounds, all different religious um, persuasions. And as Dennis Prager always says, we are the least racist multiracial country ever to exist. And it's kind of that, that ethic and that ethos that you have, you have self-reliance, that you have resilience through adversity. And you're not going to blame somebody else for your problems, right. but the universities are teaching the exact opposite. Right. I want to talk to you about, you just, you touched upon your faith in a little yes. bit. And I think that that's something um, that we talk about mm -hmm. a lot. And and can you just explain to the audience how you see God in all of this? Yes. You know, and, and how it's touched your personal life and driven some of your yeah. conservative Thank beliefs. you for asking. So I'm an evangelical Christian. So what does that mean? Ooh, you Ooh. know, people, whoa. You know, <laughs> oh, people get freaked out when they hear that. Like, oh, boy, I liked them up until now. Right. I could just see, I could, I could see the YouTube comments. Right. They're signing up. You're know, like, at 1714, you lost me there, right. Charlie. Like, you know, I get that all the time. So what's an evangelical Christian? Okay. First and foremost, we believe in a God. Okay. Maybe, maybe people can agree Left with that. signing off now. Right. Now they're all gone, right? <laughs> you believe in the voodoo man. Okay. So what is I, we believe in a God that is ubiquitous, <laughs> that is omniscient and all powerful. What does that mean? That means God is everywhere. God is all knowing. God is all powerful. Uh, God created us to be today that we as human beings are actually first and foremost spiritual beings. Um, our chemistry is all just made by God, but we are actually spirits. Um, so we, I believe in a God. Um, I believe in the Bible. I believe it's the greatest book ever to exist um, for uh, 5,000 years of history, over um, 34 authors, uh, 66 books. And then I believe God came in human form. And this is why I'm a Christian, evangelical Christian, that God came down as a gift for us broken humans to be able to accept this gift um, and his son, Jesus Christ. And that is, as talked about in the Bible, it created the Trinity. That God is the same God, but think of it as the analogy I use. Think of it as water. So water can be liquid form, water can be in our air, and water can be an ice cube. That's God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Same God, three different parts. And so Jesus Christ um, was, was God in human flesh, who first and foremost taught us how to live, but secondly and most importantly, he was a gift to us. That if we accept him as our Lord and Savior, um, then we can have eternal life and we are actually reborn. That something happens to your spirit and that you are, go through a process where um, you become actually a different person. Um, I know this might sound so bizarre and so weird for people to hear, but I've seen it happen I've, in my own life and for other people. And so why does all this matter? Um, and what we're talking about, we have to realize that there's something bigger than ourselves. Right. And I believe, and I see it, that people that are born again Christians or people like Dennis Prager that are Bible believing, Torah observing, you know, um, Jews, um, they, they approach life in a much different way that um, maybe my opinion and what I do is not the most important thing in the world. Maybe I want to do good, not just feel good. Right. Um, and so anyway, that's a short version of what I believe and why I believe it. And um, some people disagree vehemently with it, but uh, that's what makes, you know, discourse so much fun. Right. So. I think that there, there's something that you and I have touched upon privately and publicly at times. And, and it's about, you say, we're all on this quest for some for form of spiritualism. I think in our truest form, we do believe that there is something bigger than us. It's the reason why I check my horoscope, right? If, yeah. if you say someone's going to read your palm, like you, you go, you don't really know if that person can it's read your palm. It's a search for meaning, but There's right? a search for meaning that we all sort of, are, we're interested in that. Yes. And yet, when you say, this might be weird, you kept saying that, right? This might be weird to some of you guys watching. You're doing that because right now, the public discourse, you're not allowed to talk about God, are no, you? No, and so I'm actually, I, I'm actually, you're right. And so to to kind of, the left has been so militant. I have to always like preface this because right. I'm afraid I'm going to get deplatformed or discredited by saying about God. these things. I mean, yes. isn't that, think about how Which I shouldn't it, even have to say you that. You shouldn't have to say that. Yes. You should be able to openly talk about God, but we've gotten to this place in society when you've got The View and Joy Behar, who is mocking Jesus Christ, laughing yes. at Jesus Christ, uh, making fun of Mike Pence for being faithful to his wife. Is being that faithful to his, his wife, wife and, and, and believing in something other than what? Government. Yeah, but, but right? exactly. Government. And, and this is this is so important. Two, two Celebrities th as the gods, right? right? Ex the philosopher kings yeah. of our times are, right. you know, the people, the gatekeepers of Hollywood. Uh, the, the idolatry that takes place in oh, Hollywood it's sick. is a sin. It really is. And and and, and so the, the two things, the, the the atheist left, which is, it's, it's I repeat myself, because most people on the left are atheists. They are. Um, because they, they turn government into their God. They yes. turn government into their church. We've talked about this a lot. But the idea that man is nothing more than a composition of particles and chemicals, that's only about 100 years old. Um, that's that's formed from Darwinism. The idea through all the Eastern religions or all the, you know, Judeo-Christian that we're actually spiritual beings first, composed in just physical matter, that's thousands of years old. Right. And, and, so, and so the left, they make it seem as if it's very progressive, that, oh, we're just nothing more than the particles. I, I totally reject that. How many times, Candace, have we in our journey said this is a God thing? One hundred percent. God has had my back throughout this journey, and people always ask me. And actually, one of the questions that somebody wrote in is like, 
Candace, do you believe in God? Are you a God loving Christian? And the truth is, when I was a kid, my grandfather raised me to be extremely Christian. We had to wake up every day and read the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I resented that because it was so not cool when you went off to school and public, sure. you, you don't teach it when you basically secularism is all about making sure that you dismiss God from mm -hmm. the conversation. He's, it's no longer in school. It's no longer on TV. It's no longer cultural yes. anymore. So you feel weird about it when it's taught in your home. The further that I got away from God, the more liberal that I became, the more miserable mm. my life became, the wow. more mistakes that I made. Wow. And I talk about that dark period of my life from about 16 years old until uh, 22, really, When I, but I was a liberal. There's something synonymous about mm. this, this atheism and, and liberalism, and it turns you into a horrible, corrupt person. And then I found conservatism, and I was naturally drawn back into God. And now I read the scriptures every yeah. night before I go to wow. bed, and, and I'm closer with my, my grandfather That's and amazing. having conversations with him. So, so can I ask you a question, Candace? Um, no, it's my podcast. Oh, okay. No, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> F Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Um, no, um, so I, 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 let me rephrase that. Um, um, okay. So do you, being on the left and the right, you, you could talk from authority here. Um, who's happier, conservatives or liberals? Oh, with, I mean, without question, conservatives. I was miserable when I was a liberal. I was miserable, pretending to wow. be happy. And, and, and you see that when you talk about when, – when, when I see on Twitter – Right, Chelsea Handler just screaming at Trump every single Those are day. Not happy people. They are. They're miserable. Think about yes. it. She has no family, right? She has no children. They don't. And you're right. It's atheism. You have no purpose in life, yes. right? So your purpose becomes about pretending that somebody else is the reason of, for all your anger. When in reality, sure. you're angry and you're bitter because your yes. life is unfulfilled. Right. And 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 Dennis is is so spot on about this, where he says, "You ask an atheist, do you hope you're wrong?" And any atheist who hopes you're correct, that there's no God, you'll never see your loved ones again, I would never want to live that life. Right. That's so sad. And um, and I think what's happening in America is there's, a, there's an existential spiritual crisis happening where our universities, our culture are programming students to to glorify themselves. And and I, it, what matters how I, my feelings are more important than facts. Right? Like right. How I feel is much more important than what might be true. But when you believe there's a God, you might say, there's some things I might not understand. Right. That there's complexity to all this. And Candace, your testimony of, I was in an unhappy, use your word, miserable I was place. Miserable. Yeah. And you're, you're back to the scriptures. What I find it about. Was mean. And, and it's amazing because I hear this story over and over again. And the grace of God and the forgiveness and the path he leads us is real. And I, for every, anyone watching this, I encourage you just, just, Take time to read the Bible and to pray and meditate. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, you don't have to be, you, it doesn't have to be five hours and go to a church that might intimidate people. I understand that. Um, but there's something so special about the Bible because it is the most banned book, the most burned book, the most banished book ever to exist, but it's also the most read book, the most translated book, the most powerful book ever. There's something special in those pages. Right. And it almost like brings me to emotion to talk about right. it because our students are not being taught this. And in the scriptures, you will find so much depth of knowledge, so much wisdom. And in my own opinion, the most important person ever to exist. And instead, students will be pushed horrible cultural icons and bad political philosophy of the Communist Manifesto and all these books that talk about atheism instead of a book that really built Western civilization and defended these ideas. Um, and honestly, will lead to more fulfilling, happier people. I do believe that. And I, and I, to people that are listening and watching this, is just to ask yourself a very simple question, which is, are you happy? And it's a, it's a question yes. that only you can answer. And it, you can only answer that honestly to yourself. And if the answer is no, my answer was no years ago. Wow. It was absolutely, I am not a happy person. I don't feel like I'm treating people kindly. Um, and it, it could be very much that your your distance from God and your acceptance of this wow. of this this world viewpoint where there is no order, there is no structure, and it's all for naught could be the source of your misery. And that look, that's a private question. You can answer it for yourself, but that's I can such tell an you that point. yeah, I'm I, I'm a testimony to the fact that my entire life changed when I started embracing conservative uh, principles and going back to wow. the lessons that my grandfather taught me. Well, and, and just to build one more thing though, and I and I fear this is that. There is, there's one political side right now that is becoming more rejective of God and embracing you know, atheism and secularism and one that's not. And you find that that one side is consistently unhappy and full of rage and anger and not gratitude. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid that that divide's only growing further. That's correct. And I mean, they it's talked about, we can talk about this as well, but even there's something sacred about the family. 
and, and the left is doubt. doing everything it can to destroy it. Yes. The toxic feminism, right, which wants to remove men from society, which is such an important role. Women need men. Okay, men need women. There yep. is something symbiotic about a man and a woman, woman coming together. We're watching the left literally try to turn men into women and women into men to just disrupt the entire family, telling women via the school system, by the way, I was forced to take feminism 101. You can do it without a man. Like, you know, like just go out and adopt children. You don't even have to, to raise. If you want a child, you don't need a man to do that. Why are you teaching women that? Of course, if something terrible happens, God forbid, and you lose your husband, can, can a woman do it without a man? Yes. But the teach people that there's something virtuous sure. about trying to do things without men in society. That's the stuff that really scares me, the yes. breakdown of the family. And no no um, group of individuals in America has seen how the detrimental effects of that more than the black exactly. community. Exactly. And I, I ask a question is, I've never met a happiest, happy feminist 101 professor. <laughs> they're miserable. I can attest to that. They are miserable. And it's, it's, it's almost as if they're... The, amp, the, air, the um, armpit hair is very long. Your words, not mine. No, I'm just saying. My, my, my professor, it's a fact. You can look her up. She had very long armpit hair. And just it comment. seems as if they're, they're determined to use their position of influence to teach the anger they have within themselves onto other people. Correct. Correct. And... What's as you always say, Candace? Well, what was the answer? Hate men. Yeah. What do you want for lunch? <laughs> Hate, Hate men. men. That's what I learned in class. No yeah. matter what it what it was in feminism one hundred and one, here's what you learn. No matter what it is that you're going through, you can blame it on a man. You lose your car keys in the morning. Why? The patriarchy. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's an right. A. You want to yes. get an A in that class? Yes. That's an A. And, and that comes from a horrible position of resentment and anger and rage. And have women um, at times been, you know. That have injustices at the hands of individuals. Of course. Of course. I uh, have men also had injustices at the you know, hands of women. Yes. People wrongly accused of things. Right. All Kavanaugh. sorts of things. Right. So we can go <laughs> through that. Um, but to create an artificial um, phantom of, of evil and program students to believe that um, – is really, really, really concerning. Absolutely. So I want to jump into some of these questions. Sure. That we could go sense. on forever. Yeah, this could be a five-hour podcast. And th- we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna end up uh, talking about some of this stuff, anyways. But first question. This is actually really funny. Okay. Who is the better driver? Okay, hold on a I second. Don't know. I'm gonna answer this question. Actually, Charlie Kirk never lets me drive, so this maybe he's sexist. He never this lets is me very drive, correct. and he's a horrible driver. On top of it, well, hold on. I'm very, very good. Zero, horrible. zero car well, accidents. He never lets me drive. I, I'm very benevolent. Okay. <laughs> This is this is my argument. I I care so much for Candace Owens. I want her to be able to tweet uninterrupted of traffic <laughs> patterns. Ooh, nice spin. That's a very nice spin. This is the, the spin stops here, okay? <laughs> and I, I I will say without a shadow of a doubt, every time it's not even a question. I just go right into the driver's <laughs> seat. Me. I'm like, not, Charlie, I could drive. He's like, no, 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 no. You're no, a woman. No, I, 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 no because, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's, no, 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 I, I, I want to be very clear about this. Bob, Bob he's never I, I want to be very clear. Bob. It's, I don't know if she's a good driver or a bad driver. <laughs> I would never, I would never make that prejudice whatsoever. <laughs> Instead, it is a man's role to protect the woman. <laughs> Right? And you protect them by being able to drive so that she can tweet uninterrupted. And I will attribute her Twitter growth over mine to the fact <laughs> that when we're driving through the San Bernardino Valley, I have to try to avoid burning cars and she can continue to tweet uninterrupted. So well done. you're welcome. It's really it's such love. Congratulations, John. I mean, you're just you're a wonderful human being. Thank you. Thank this you. question is, is so interesting. And I, I, I thought, and, and a lot of these questions came in that were like this, uh, which is jarring to me. And it really shows you how social media doesn't present um, reality all the time. Do you ever doubt yourselves? Of course. And it's like, of course, right? I mean, yeah. and, and it just shows you, and, uh, and we can talk about social media a lot, that every everything you see on social media is a highlight. And, and That's a great um, way to put you, it. Yeah, it's a highlight of people's lives. And you're like, oh my God, this person's life seems so cool. But the stuff that we have gone through over the last year, I mean, there have been moments where I was just crying in bed and and shouting at Charlie on the phone. Like, I mean, we've gotten into into fights and mm-hmm. um and things get really heated and vicious because we're we're fighting a war together. And but the thing is, is our names are are tagged to it. Yes. So everything that comes out, it's Charlie Kirk, it's Candace Owens, it's Candace Owens, it's Charlie Kirk, and there's so much hurt and emotion and pain that goes on behind the scenes. And I want to really stress that point because I know that there are a lot of kids now that go through depression and angst and they they look at people's lives on social media and they think wow I wish I had that life but yes what we do is it's hard it's very hard and and do you doubt yourself of course of course I do and there's some things that I haven't doubted in a long time 
there's some things that I'll doubt daily. And look, it's it's hard to put into words. And Candace is probably one of the only human beings that can sympathize with what I'm going to say. It's really hard to wake up to eight reporters that want to destroy your life. Yeah. Like, that's not fun. fun. It's just not it, there. And do you doubt you? Of course you do. But the, and what we have learned, Candace, through this trial by fire is the right. only real way to put it is the only person this is so cliche. I hate it, but it's cliche because it's true. The only person that can debase it is yourself. Right. Is that if you give up and then then that then they have won. Right. Um, and it, it, it is pers- persistence and perseverance and the grit right. is really one of the key components to being able to um, to pioneer ahead. And for people that are dealing with depression and angst and anxiety, understand that some of the most miserable people I know in private situations live perfect social media lives. <laughs> that's perfect. a really that's a really good way to put it. And and, and so and I am I'm trying to to reconfigure my lens of how I process social media. Right. Um, and I love when people say I was wrong and I'm sorry and I like instead of just I think the whole kind of Instagram influencer rise the last four or five years where everyone has perfectly polished right. pictures overlooking the Santa Monica Pier, you know, and it's just, <laughs> yeah. you know, exactly what I'm saying, right? As, as the sun is setting and it's just perfect. And right. like, oh, I want my life to be that way. And right. in reality, they're looking through Instagram saying, I want my life to look that way. And right. everyone wants their own life to look the other way. And I don't know what the equivalent of that was in the 1970s. I don't know. Well, I think I don't think there was. That's think, what I'm and saying. I think like, that people don't have they people have to understand that that we're, we live in a different world now. But don't think because you follow me or that you follow Charlie that this has by any means been easy. There have been moments where I've sat him down and he thought that his whole life was over and was like, if th- like this is they're just trying to kill me and destroy me. And I'm like, you get your get your head out of the sand. Like we fight, we go yes. on. And there have been yes. moments that I've called you and said yes. like, this is it, it's over. Like I can't do this anymore. And he's been like, you get your ass up out of bed and you keep going. And it's so, so important for you guys to understand that. Yes. Um, the, the next day, it always does get better, well, guys. It and, gets and here's, better. Here's the other thing is g- giving up should never be an option. And also surround yourself with people like Candace that whatever you're doing that can relate and that when you say when you say something – that um, they're going to tell you, you know, the truth, and they're going to be honest. Um, but they'll also have your back. And I understand this might sound um, cliche, but it's so hard to find that. Right. It's so hard to find that kind of loyalty. That um, you know, the, the kind of the old expression is, you know, when you're in a foxhole, you want you want someone who <laughs> is not going to tell you that there's no bullets being fired. You want just to say where the bullets are coming from. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right? exactly you right. Know? Yeah. You don't want someone in the foxhole with you being like, well, <laughs> want to get a hot dog. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a burger or a smoothie. You want to say, no, no, no. There's a machine gun nest over right. there. There's mortar shells coming from there. Right. Well, here's what we're going to do here's to be able to do Here's the plan of that. action to get out of this. Exactly. Right. And, and, and um, that's the type of friend that you want. And you definitely don't want one that's going to run for the hills behind right. you. Yeah. And you're we've alone. had those. Run. We've had those. Yes. We definitely know who our allies are. And totally. Prager you is one of them. Amen. Amen. Um, next question. I love this question okay. so much. If Trump wasn't running in 2020, who would win? I love this question. I didn't know my voice could do that. That was very impressive. (laughs) Wow. I've got an answer. Ready? China. (laughs) Okay, yes. Um, China would win. The illegals would win. (laughs) MS-13, the illegals. (laughs) They would be winning. The drugs would win. They'd have a big day. Drugs would be unbelievable. Drug dealers would be having the best day Drug dealers would be the winners. (laughs) Fentanyl, it's the worst. (laughs) Um, he does really good impressions. No, by that's the way. actually very. That's a, a very good, good answer. Point. China would win. China would win if if Trump wasn't winning. But let I mean, look, I want to say this. God bless and thank God for Donald Trump I mean, for honestly, what he's doing. I love my president. So oh much. my goodness, this I love guy. him so much. I, uh, I, I, he makes me just want to drape myself in an American flag, run out screaming the national anthem in a mad hat. Like I just am the most patriot, and it feels so good. You know what feels so good about patriotism? It's a family. Your color yes. doesn't matter. Your creed yes. doesn't matter. It's like we are an American family. You we'll turn talk around. talk about that, Candace. How does he, like, I mean, this horrible person, they say, how does Donald Trump treat Candace Owens he's, when you've met him? He's just the most lovely, warm human being, and he gets it, and he fights for us yes. every single day. And there's something about being around people and realizing that it doesn't matter how tall, how short, whether you're Christian, whether you're Jewish, whether you're black, whether you're a woman, or whether you're a female, you are united by the philosophy yes. of America. And it, yes. it's beautiful. Yes, it's it that knows e no pluribus color. unum out of many one. Right. And as Dennis Prager says, the American Trinity is in God we trust, liberty, and e pluribus right. unum. It's that, and Donald Trump believes in that to his core. Right. And he fights and he fights and he fights. And if it wasn't for him, our country would be in such a sour 
Horrible, horrible Which place. Which brings us back to the question, who do you actually think would win if Trump didn't run in 2020? Oh, like, he was like, you know, you know what? what? No, Four the, years you is know enough. What? Here, a de- uh, you know, a Democrat would win. That's the answer. No, That's the Jerry, answer. I didn't want to say it, but no, you said correct. it. I wasn't going to say it, but you said yes. it. And, and here's the one thing I will say, yeah. though. Hey, he said it. Yeah. I, I, I said it. Everyone else was thinking Everyone else was thinking it. I said it. Okay. Um, yeah. A Democrat would win. Who because would it be? Um, of right now, of the Super Bowl. I can't wait, look, by the way. It's, I can't it's wait. the Trump-hating Olympics is no, really I, what it is. I can't by wait. the way, I just, I, I don't know when this will air, so I'm going to say it, but like Klobuchar announcing for president, it, talking like, about I mean, global warming <laughs> in, the midst, in the midst of a blizzard. It was just amazing. Global warming <laughs> will end the country. Just like this is too good, I can't make this up. God has a sense of humor. No, <laughs> God is hilarious. Oh no, and, and, but, <laughs> of course, because no, actually, it's very biblical. If you believe that God is ubiquitous, all powerful, and all creating, you believe humor exists. Of course, God, God has a has sense, sense of humor. humor. God has a sense of humor. That's all I can say. And by the way, can we just talk about Elizabeth Warren announcing for president? Oh my, my god, my favorite thing. She chugs a beer. Well, not really. After she so attacks awkward. Kavanaugh, and then she thanks her husband for being there. <laughs> like, know, where else would her husband be? I can't wait. Thank you. Thank wait. you for being here. You're, you're Welcome, honey. Do you, do you take attendance earlier or something? Like, <laughs> just like I can't wait. Everyone's like, I'm, I just can't wait. It's gonna be such a freak show. I can't, oh, it's, I, can, it's, I can't wait. Cory Booker. I will. Oh, I am Spar- No, you're not. Have a seat. Yeah, but, it, but it, you, have, you have Spartacus. You have Gillibrand. You have Pocahontas. It's just like it's so um, good. It's like they're, they're like, coffee man might run. It's like they're trying to make. Tra- they're doing it for Trump at this point. I mean, like he's it's, gonna have so much fun. He's just gotta be laughing every time they make it. Oh no, he loves it. He can't wait. He, 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 he and, and it's great because then they're gonna become even more radical. Yeah, and I think, Kamala. Harris, total oh, snore fest, well, well, by the that, way. I mean, look, yeah, that's, you, you, she, she's so forgettable. I mean, just like that's a great word for Kamala Harris. She's very she forgettable. Like, like, it's kind of like you see the speech running? after thirty minutes. You're kind of like, did yeah. you just watch something? <laughs> did someone just speak? Did, yeah, I, <laughs> she just is the most forgettable. I, I, I remember. Feel bad. I, I remember a rally of some sort. Yeah, really she, don't know she's what. She's the Jan Brady. Yes, that's yeah, a, that's you know? very very good. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's very good. That was a cheap shot, but yeah, that's very, I'm, very good. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All but right. I, okay, go ahead. Okay, okay. Next question. I want to get through these because people always want to ask questions. Yes. Um, what's your favorite book? My By the f- way, just so you guys know, Preface says Charlie was a total freak kid. He didn't really get into enough, but he was like one of those kids that had to send to like special school because he was like special super school. smart. He's like reading Saul Linsky's Rules for Radicals when he was six. Backwards in Korean. No, I'm kidding. Right. But, <laughs> He's just... No. Um, look, the Bible is my favorite book. That's that's right. without being, you know, without saying. But um, let me let me think outside of that. Uh, Free to Choose by Milton Friedman probably had the Your greatest. Milton Friedman. Yeah, guy. had my big, the biggest impact on liberal. So the, the, the Bible being the, my favorite book, but the, the book that had the most transformative impact in my life, not just because of the contents, but by the approach, was Free to Choose by Milton Friedman. And let me tell you why. It's because I was taught nothing but government-run economics and Keynesian economics. And to read a book that was so con- contrary that other people could think differently right. made me reconsider everything. Wow. Made me think How that old I, were you read it? I was in eighth grade. Okay. And it was written by uh, Milton and Rose Friedman. Great. I was just um, like doing my thing. Yes. Like, you know, I was in middle school. So and, totally weird. And, but if, if, <laughs> if, 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 if but, but, like, who does this in eighth yes, grade? Well, Milton Friedman, free to choose. It, 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 it's a great book. And um, <laughs> I, I was so moved by it because I thought, well, what else am I being taught that's a lie? Right. And then I just went on a vociferous quest right. of, you know, what F.A. Hayek and all this other stuff that just, then it built my philosophy. So right. it was less about the contents, even though contents are brilliant. And it was more about, whoa. By the way, the greatest compliment that Charlie and I have ever received, well, I'm saying it for him, but that I've ever received was when people said that you two as a duo are like the modernized Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell. They used to do that, like the that series is, together. That is an amazing compliment. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it's a higher compliment than I deserve, but I was just like, oh. Thomas Sowell, what an unbelievable oh, that, treasure. You know, he, he's just, he really is An a treasure. American treasure. Right. He apprenticed under Milton Friedman. Right, and, and I just, he he brought me to my conservative Isn't awakening. that amazing? Yeah, so I, I totally get it. Okay, um, if you had to live in one country outside of the USA, what would it God be? God forbid. That would be, <laughs> that would be an absolute punishment. <laughs> it would be. Oh my is goodness. Israel. Country. Israel. Israel. I would live in Israel. It's because you like the food. I love hummus. We went we went to the embassy opening in Jerusalem and he just like it had was, a field it was, day it was over like, the food. It and... was the best day ever, every day. <laughs> it's just, it's just... It was hummus and tzatziki and <laughs> just was it was the best just, I day love ever. platters of food. Does, I don't know. There's really something does. there's something very uniting about having you know, kind of the com- communitarian way of eating. I love Israel. I've, I felt so spiritual there. Right. I felt in touch with God. Um, I love the people. I love the background. I love everything about it. So if I had to live somewhere except uh, the United States, God forbid, it would be right. Israel. Interesting. Okay. Views on marijuana. Um, 
so I have a I have an interesting view. Um, I reject the culture around marijuana. I think no one should do it except I defend people's right to do it. I right. think it should be legalized and taxed. Um, just because I think something's a bad idea doesn't mean I think it should be illegal. Right. Um, and you know, there's lots of things that are legal that I think people shouldn't do, but I think they should be legal. I do believe in freedom, um, but I also believe in self, you know, self responsibility. That also means I don't. I think people that get government benefits should be drug tested, stuff like that. Right. Um. So yeah, uh, I am more open minded than most on marijuana. Um, but I also, I, I think I've seen it screw up a lot of people's lives. Let me put it that way too. Yeah, but the fact that you've seen it screw up a bunch of people's lives is proof that like prohibiting it doesn't That's stop exactly it. right. You know what I that's mean? My, that's how that, I came that's to this. That's my point. Yeah, that, I'm just, that, everyone that, that, that I know has smoked marijuana. You can get it at any time. Yeah. And so we spent hundreds of billions of dollars right. trying to enforce and make something illegal ineffectively. Yeah, it's like prohibition, the prohibition era. Totally. People are, people are still going to do it. So you, in my opinion, like I, I totally agree with you. People should be free to choose whether they want to do it. I think it's really stupid. I totally agree. Um, you should be free to choose these things judge. that are dumb. Yeah, I mean, if, if that's yeah, exactly, you should be, you should totally have the freedom to choose things that are dumb. Okay, who is, I, I already know this, you, you kind of already touched on this, your all-time favorite historical figure, is it Milton Friedman or is there someone else? Jesus uh, Christ? Uh, uh, yeah, I would Friedman. say, I got to always say Jesus Christ probably. Um, Wow, that is a great question. Historical figure. So just for like to make it fun, let's just say before 1850. Okay, he's amending your question. Whoever yes, whoever this, home, is. whoever this is. Susie from Buffalo. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just, <laughs> it's amazing, stunning. right? That's the Mensa. I mean, it's, I'm kidding. Um, so I, I, I love the American founding fathers. Ben Franklin, I always really enjoyed. Um, you know, I re George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, are, are, I think, are too cliche. So one I really enjoy that I just love learning from is Julius Caesar. Um, I think he's one of the most interesting historical figures. He, if you want to talk about someone who lived a full life, right. it's Julius Caesar. From conquering northern Germania to surviving and winning a Roman civil war right. to an unusual alliance and quelling a rebellion with Cleopatra um, to eventually becoming, to ending the Roman Republic, to starting the Roman Empire, and then seeing the people that he benefited the most turn against him. Right. I think there's something very tragic and very interesting about that. So I think it's one of the most interesting. And you could learn, if there's something to learn about humanity, you could, you could learn it through the prism of Julius Caesar. Interesting. I was not expecting you to say that. That's really good. Okay, this is one we're going to both have to answer. What do you disagree with Trump on? You first. Hillary should be in prison. Okay. <laughs> he, he should have hit harder on that. I really think that he should be pursued. He should be just... Yes. Especially because they are everything that he is going through, um, un that he's unjustly going through. Yes. It can be attributed to her losing the election. And they are just the most evil and the most corrupt individuals. And the idea of them getting away with it and not being in a cell drives me insane. So I want you to tell me how you really feel about Yeah, no, issue. I'm serious. <laughs> Trump, if you're listening and you're watching, yes. this is what I disagree on. I want this campaign promise delivered. Lock her up. So um, I totally right, I agree with you on that. <laughs> and he is watching. And he will watch. <laughs> so I'll say three things just because these are the three things I always use. Um, I have a non, I guess you could say conservative view on the death penalty. I'm actually against the death penalty totally and completely. Um, and Trump is very pro-death penalty. Uh, this is something where Dennis and I don't agree on. Yeah. So um, first of all, we wrongly execute people uh, way more frequently than I'm ever comfortable with. You look at right. the data. It's actually more expensive uh, doing the death penalty because of all the appeals. Um, and, and also, if I think we are going to make an argument of not having taxpayer funded abortion, right, right. then we should not say, have it's not taxpayer. Consistent. Yes, so I'm, yeah. I, and I, I'm so consistent I'm against it on that. Second thing um, that I would disagree with, I don't disagree with, but I just, I, I don't even say, is that I just, I'm so sick and tired of treating Saudi Arabia as our friend. No, this is something that is, we could unpack that for a really long time. That could be a whole episode. Yeah, of Saudi I mean, Arabia. they funded 9 11, right. 15 out of 19, the hijackers right. were uh, Saudi Arabian. Um, and I, if it was any other country except the country that we had a huge oil agreement with, mm -hmm. we would not be treating them the way that we are. Um, and That's they, exactly right. It's, it's business. Yeah, and it, it really pains me and it sickens me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something I think we as conservatives need to take a much better look at. Right. They sell arms to al-Qaeda. Um, they fund Wahhabi mosques all across the world. And again, their involvement in 9-11 really just makes me sick. And then the right. third thing I guess you could say is the marijuana thing. With President Trump, um, I I don't I th he think he's softening on it, but I just I just don't think it's something that we should treat in the same classification as cocaine. No, absolutely not. And, and absolutely because, and, not. And, and, and I I've seen cocaine and heroin and opioids really destroy people's lives. Right. I think we should so just you know I think we should go harder after the pill pushing pharmaceutical companies right. than after marijuana dispensaries.
And and because I, I think that there's pharmaceutical companies that are pushing opioids on people. Right. That's no different than gang than uh, drug dealers on the side of that's streets. Ex- yeah, that's exactly right. I actually totally agree with you. So those are my three things. Points. Yeah, I actually totally agree. Okay, this person says non sarcastically, who is a Democrat leader that you think could be of value? I like this question. That's a really interesting. Yeah, question. let's be nice for a second. Should we be nice for a second? <laughs> We're not capable of being this nice. Final Jeopardy. <laughs> no, yeah, I know. Final just Jeopardy. Um, Who could be of value? I actually, I mean, this is kind of a weird way to answer the question, um, but I do see Alexandria Ocasio Cortez as being of value to us in a weird way. I think first and foremost, um, this sort of radical leftism that she preaches is actually going to throw the more moderate people yes. our way. Um, Because I do not believe, like the people like Nancy Pelosi, um, they're not actually radical leftists, but they've been using radical leftist rhetoric to combat Trump. And what's unfortunately happened is is that it's birds, a radical leftist movement within their party that has effectively splintered their party. Mm -hmm. And she's shown that she's unafraid to go after the the moderates. She's not afraid to go after Pelosi. She's not afraid to go after Schumer if need be. So in a weird way, I think that their party is actually like splintering as our party is uniting. Yes. Yes. And so... Someone who could be a value. I totally agree. I right. think AOC will. It's a weird way to say well, value, but down the yeah, line, I, I mean, think she could help. She's constantly wrong and never in doubt. Right. Um, which is horrifying. She's passionately stupid. Yeah, she's passionately stupid. That's yeah. correct. Um, she's very telegenic, though. She's she, she's been she's gotten training on camera, though. She she's good in the sense that she knows how to be endearing to a population. Right. On on TV, well, it's I, called infantilizing herself. That and that, yeah, that, that grosses me out in a way that we could talk about this. But the, the this new um, breed of women who want to talk like toddlers and Christine, pretend Christine, Christine, Christine Blasey Ford, Ford right? Mm-hmm. Another example of this. The left has this whole thing where they, raise they their want voice women to, to go like this. Oh. Oh, well, Charlie, I didn't know what you meant by that, but I really do think that it would be good if we could just do more good stuff. You are, and so from it a- It grosses me out. That's really good. That trumps your Trump. And yeah. from a scientific point of view, um, for for when when people hear that, they back away. They do, and they won't ask her tough questions because right. because a man does not want to attack a toddler female. Um, Nor so should they. The strategy yeah. behind it, this is the truth, the strategy behind it is actually sickening. There's something about mm-hmm. it that grosses me out, and I hit hard yeah. on it, and yeah. we need to, when we go on college campuses, talk more about it, in my opinion, because S- uh, if she sat across from me, she knows I'd go right in, which is why she doesn't want to debate sure. me, she doesn't want to debate you, no. she doesn't want to debate any conservative. Yeah, she, you know, I actually, it's so interesting you say this, Candace. I went, I really thought, I did some research. She has never done an interview with somebody on the center right. Of course not, because she-, she I she, want you to think about yeah. that. She's a, a sitting congresswoman with 3 million Twitter followers who's releasing this nonsense Green New Deal has never been challenged by a journalist that's on the center or center right. We got a ton of questions about her. You well, and I got a ton of yeah, questions about her. She, and by the way, this is the one thing I will say, and I want your opinion, Candace, on this, and I, and I think I agree, is I don't know if we should ignore her or not. Because she has a, she's getting a lot of traction. You saw it in the questions. No, she's she, look. She has she's really good at social media in the same way that I'm really good at social media. Um, and there, there's no question about it. But I think that people are fearful of her because they think, what if one day she becomes president? And she never will because in order to become president, you do eventually have to debate. She avoids debating like the plague because she actually is not smart. Yes. Um. So somebody that thinks that there's what four chambers of Congress is not going to yes. debate on a stage and win. Yes. So she's not going to go far and be the president one day. But she is going to to um push ideas to a younger audience because she's able to to sell them yes. in a way that seems palatable on social media. Sure. So, so that's the harm. I maybe will move to Brooklyn and run against her. Well, I think you would win. Um, well, I just have fun debating her. Well, I would. So a Democrat that could be a value is Bloomberg. Um, let me you tell you what. Absolutely correct. Um, he is not a leftist. He's so wrong on climate change. He's just like wrong. Um, he wants to control other people's lives. But he does generally believe in markets. Mm-hmm. I mean, he has hope built. So. He, I mean, <laughs> I sure hope that so. would be fun. Like right. my whole life is a lie. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, great. Sell your Bloomberg terminals, right. boy. I mean, but and I don't think he wants to r- radically redefine America. I really don't. But here's why I think he could be a value. He has enough ego to spend 150 million dollars to try to moderate the Democrat Party, and they will become more radical because of that. Interesting. Um, and I think it would start a Democrat civil war because, <laughs> no, in a, very, in a very special way, and their radicalism will show where they'll, they'll say, you're not allowed to talk about this, Mayor Bloomberg, because you're a white billionaire. Right. 
Right. And so we're effectively actually coming up with the same answer. That's right. No, we're coming at it from different ways. People that break up the party in a weird way and actually expose and put a light. The radicalism that's within their ranks. Yeah, exactly. And because Mayor Bloomberg, he lives in the Democratic Party the 1970s. Right. He doesn't – I don't even think he realizes what the Democrat Party has become. No, no. And actually he's starting to – and Howard Schultz is like he doesn't – Coffee Man has no idea what's going on right now. (laughs) He's like, I research my positions. I I try to be moderate. He's getting like booed like, screw you, Coffee Man. (laughs) It's like, you know, um, and so to, it, I would love to see both Howard Schultz and Mayor Bloomberg and even Tom Steyer have a billionaire contest of who could finish third in Iowa. Right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This goes right into the next question, I think, pretty well. Um, are there any areas where capitalism does not work? Well, I think I think capitalism is wrongly blamed for certain societal injustices. The answer is, are there externalities in a market that sometimes need to be addressed? The answer is, of course. Of course. I am not an anarcho-capitalist. Right. I am not. Some people are. I am not. Nor was Milton Friedman. Right. Um, there are certain people that wrote on anarcho-capitalism throughout the 20th century. I am not one of those people. So you and I both believe in, yeah. the, in the Sherman Antitrust Act. Right, exactly. I mean, that shows you when capitalism goes too far and that we don't have limited government, which we do believe in at Turning Point USA. We believe in a limited yes. small government um, to protect us from, you know, this – Radi- radical capitalism, which is what it, when the the baron robbers totally. came in and they were able to create these monopolies, which cut people out, and they actually that actually isn't fair capitalism. Totally, the little guy can't compete with the big guy uh, because they just keep swooping up all the smaller companies. Yeah, and and I don't think we should worship capitalism. I think we should have a, a, have a reverence for markets. Right, and markets. So markets are embedded in the idea of markets are entrepreneurs. That's correct. And so whenever and competition, right? So let's use Google for example right now. It should and, be broken up. Yeah, and I agree with you. So why would why do we want that? Well, first of all, the Sherman Antitrust Act you went after Standard Oil for owning forty seven percent of the oil market. Okay, um, prices were going down and all that, but still they said there was something wrong with it. I agree with that. Okay, Google has eighty eight percent of the search market right now. I don't know how they're not being touched. Google and PragerU is... is fighting like hell against Google. Right. And good good for you guys yeah, for so doing this that. This is why I love PragerU. Totally like to stand up to to Google is a big deal. And... So so to, to, so if, if you believe in equal application of the law, which is a conservative value, it shouldn't be like, okay, Standard Oil and Microsoft in the 1990s, you remember Microsoft went through a huge Sherman Antitrust Act um, lawsuit against Apple. And essentially they were broken up. They had to give money to Apple and actually led to the rise of, of Apple um, significantly in the 1990s. Nevertheless, um, I think – here's what I will say though. I will say capitalism gets blamed for a lot of the ails of cronyism. Right. Yes. I will say We that. are both totally against crony capitalism. Totally against it. Right. And so the left will misrepresent um, capitalism as cronyism. Right. Inside our access deals, we hate – you know, inefficient corporations bailing lobbying, out, bailing, bailing out, out Wall the Street. bailing out the auto industry right. and bailing out the banks against it. Totally, totally against, against it. it. And, and by the way, I'm I think that some of the Wall Street bankers, based on the laws that are written, should have went to prison. Right. I mean, they, they, of course they should have gone. I mean, have you, what's the movie? The Big Short. The Big Short. Yeah. Nobody got in trouble. No, no one went to prison. No one went to prison. Well, and by the way, Fannie and Freddie should, people should have went to prison right. too, which are the government agency. I mean, so so look, I, I think we can have some agreement with people on the left with stuff like that. But where I really reject, and I it, it really makes me angry is when they say, well, this is because of capitalism. Well, well, look, there's nothing capitalistic about Amazon searching a, for a $100 billion contract from the Department of Defense. That's not capitalism. No, that's, that's cronyism. Not, yeah, that's cronyism. It's Jeff Bezos who owns the Washington Post and buys off all these politicians that he gets a $100 billion contract. Right. So. He's someone that should be investigated. Um, why has this young generation taken such an entitlement belief? Wow. What a great, great, great question. I have a theory on it. So I'll do my theory, and I'd love to hear yours, if that's okay. Yeah, um, of so I think you have to ask yourself, why would someone want to be entitled to something? Well, you get entitled. You want to believe you're entitled to something if you believe you're a victim. And where does victimhood come from? It comes from the softening and the weakening of that's an entire totally generation. Correct. And so when a generation gets never has to go through any sort of um, any sort of uh, what's the nothing? Word we didn't, no for? Great Depression, no That's war. Exactly we, right. We've lived through so nothing. We're, so we're millennials are the millennials in America are the most spoiled yes. individuals in the on the they face of the They have it better planet. than anyone else anyone in the history else, of the world. Which is in the why, history of the which world, which is why they feel they're suffering so much. That's, that's right. That's right? right. They've never been through any sort of what's the word, word I'm looking for. In, in, um, tragedy. Adver- adver- adversity. That's adversity. the word I'm looking for. My goodness, yeah. it took me two minutes to get there. They've never been through any sort of adversity. 
And their idea of adversity is they had to stay up late and publish a paper. Like, feel bad for me. Right. Great. I had okay. to stay up really late tonight. I, I mean, we, we had we in, the 19, in the morning. In the 1950s, in the 1940s and 50s, as you say commonly, our boys rushed to the beach of Normandy and went to World War II to fight the great evil. Mm-hmm. In the 1960s, our boys were drafted to go fight in Vietnam in a war that I felt was unjust that never should have been declared upon. So on and so forth. The the equivalent of our, you know, our generation is... Right. You know, my... I have to hear Ben Shapiro speak on campus. Or my, my Uggs were delivered <laughs> right. two days late. Yeah. Or my <laughs> pumpkin spice my pumpkin <laughs> spice latte yeah. is right. imbalanced yeah. Yeah. or yeah. something. No, seriously, there's not enough pumpkin and spice in my pumpkin I mean, spice give, latte. Give me a break. No, no, no. It's, it's sickening. And that's what it is, is that when you've lived through absolutely nothing, there's a long quote about that. Like, you know, when a, a generation that lives through weak, nothing weak men creates create, weak yeah, men. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah and uh, like... And, Good times create weak men. Right. And weak Bad men, times yeah. create strong men. And you've yes. got this going on. And unfortunately, we have created the weakest we, the weakest period of men in the millennial American that's generation. That's correct. That's and correct. And when I say men, I mean men and women. I, Justin Trudeau. Mankind. Humankind. Yes. Whatever, you know. But you get what I'm saying. And, and, and it's it's really can be attributed to the fact that we've lived through nothing. And when I say that my grandfather has never said anything about racism or called people racist and said that he deserves this or that, and yet he lived through a racist period yes. in, Ameri- in America where there was actually pieces of legislation um, that were racist. And I see black Americans well, stay on campus and, and, you, and you, Charlie and I will ask this question, Bob, at the beginning. And I will say, just to see what planet I'm on before this. we even get started. <laughs> what planet this, I'm yeah, on. Yeah, just, that's what I say. Just to see what planet I'm on before we even get started. How many people believe that America is a more racist country today than it was in the 1940s? Hands go up. And I go, okay, we're not on Earth today. Let's get started. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 Jarring. It takes Jarring. an extraordinary amount of effort to get to something that's screwed up. Right. <laughs> I mean, just think it's about that. It's, it's, it's a good question. We just want to see what planet we're on so we know if there's gravity in the room. Thing. How many people Dozens. Dozens. And then and then they'll say to us, it's a different type of racism. Oh. No, it's it's even like more, so it's even more sinister. Different than hanging people from trees. Yeah, yeah, totally yeah, exactly. different okay. than hanging people from trees. Yeah. That well, is what we right. are fighting on college campuses, just to get them to like a little bit closer to reality where you can say, hey, you can at least say, fine, I believe in racism, whatever. But if you can't acknowledge that America has made progress from the 1940s, 2019, as you're a black person sitting at UCLA in Cold One of the Mingo, nicest like, schools in right. the world. Speaking, up, speaking and a, going and to not. listen to a black woman. Yeah. Sp- I mean, it's just, it's jarring, but this is what the education system can actually yes. do to people's minds. Yes. And, and so he, the, take it to kind of a really interesting extreme. A group of people I think everyone can learn from are living Medal of Honor recipients. And what's amazing, and I've had a chance to meet a couple. We, we met one at one of our Turning Point USA events. What's unbelievable is these people have lived through hell. You don't live and get the Medal of Honor without seeing and experiencing something beyond. You you have seen people die. You've probably killed other people. You've done something so heroic and so amazing. And without a shadow of a doubt, every Medal of Honor recipient I have met, they are so humble and they want nothing in return. They don't consider themselves a victim. They don't want a special award ceremony. They don't want a special thing from government. It's like, I was just doing my duty. And when when someone goes through such unbelievably harsh times, you see this through all, all of our veterans, right? They're absolutely amazing. It it, it, it it creates a posture of your soul and of your person where you're thankful to be living in this country and you're not a spoiled, entitled brat like most of our, you know, unfortunately, like most of our generations. Brats. And so when Bernie Sanders comes along or an AOC comes along and they say, you're entitled to all these things because you've lived through so much. <laughs> and like, hell they lived through what the hell have i lived and, through and then i look and i look and i see the greatest generation what they had to live through right where they were families that went off to war and half the brothers came back i just want you to think about yeah, that no, i mean that literally <laughs> like your, your chances of surviving on on d-day i always talk about that think that they knew that the, those boys knew they were going to die i mean just think about that yes and they, and went, they knew they that anyways. if you don't take this beach at this time right very little uh, the, the likelihood of even taking the European theater within two years is low. Right. Like they had a three day window to take Europe through one entry point because they deceived the Germans. They deceived them through a counterintelligence campaign. They fired Pat and they thought they're going to invade on the northern side of Germany, uh, on France, and they went to Normandy and right. they still lost. Think of Dunkirk, the British taking yes. their own ships over to go save. I mean, like one of the, the most... amount of bravery that yes. it took to say, I'm just a fisherman and I'm just going to go go save our boys. And, and, yes. and today we have people that just can't deal with the fact that Charlie and Candace are going to come talk about conservative principles. Yeah, they need a safe space. And they're crying. Really, really tough. It is tough. Yeah, I don't know. How they I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, re- it's really hard. You guys hard. are all struggling right now. Yeah, Hashtag it's, oppressed. It's <laughs> yes. Okay. Last question. Last one. The question that is on everyone's mind on Instagram. Go. I know what this I know what this is. 
Charlie Kirk. Yes. Did you ever date Candace Owens? Not in real life. <laughs> so we, we kept the fake relationship going for some time. Is that going correct, strong. Candace? Going strong. Going strong. But, but Candace Owens is engaged now, I which is engaged. amazing, to yes. a wonderful man. And I thought we were going to get such, like, when I announced my engagement, my, my fiancé, we were expecting such, like, horrible comments, but actually they all went to Charlie. Charlie got trolled the hardest. It was all me. It was all I got you. They were like, it was exclusive Charlie to was me. friend zoned. Charlie. Yes, Charlie was sold a pack of lies yeah, this, this entire time. Yeah, this is cheating on Charlie. Yeah, like Charlie's so sad and heartbroken. And Charlie's being, you know, all these sorts of things. So the answer is no. No. But we do, I'm Candace so sorry. is my dearest friend in the world yes. and I couldn't be happier for we what. We know way too much about each other. That's correct. We're like brother and but sister. we have gone through so much and <laughs> everything from going to the embassy, move in Jerusalem, from going to driving from San Francisco to LA just because our yeah yeah, I was driving I I was driving let's be very clear about this she was riding she was passengering um is that a word we'll make we'll make it one um but getting kicked out of a restaurant in Philadelphia that was fun um and that was really something to being heckled at campus events all sorts of fun things right it's been quite a journey and uh we wouldn't trade it for the world no it's been a wonderful journey on the dating thing so we have a section now that comes like I get texts from all the staff while we're in here oh my god that's amazing are they watching (laughs) Some of them are watching, and I got to get these questions in. Or, you know, I may not be here next week, so okay. Gotta, these are important ones, okay? So on that thing, one of them was actually, do you date? And what is your What's your oh, I, I I hold those I hold it very close to my chest, but I am in a relationship. Okay. Um, the world will know soon enough. Yeah. but I am unavailable. I will say this. I will yield to Charlie, my attorney. Yes, Charlie dates. Charlie has a girlfriend. Okay. I absolutely love her. Nice. I adore her. Um, and she, yeah, she's known about our like everyone was thinking Charlie and I were dating. Charlie had a girlfriend. Everyone was thinking that oh. Charlie and I were dating. I had a boyfriend. Uh, she really is a, a wonderful human being. Oh, thank you. Um, and yeah, she's extraordinary. We try and to keep our private lives a little more private, just because. Yes, the, because look, the, the opposition is so vicious. So vicious. Right. So, so now in I'm time, the world will know. Answer. Yeah. So the second question. Will you ever run for office one day? I have no, honestly the, the honest answer to this is I really have no plans to do that. Charlie um, will be president one day if I don't run against him. Oh wow! <laughs> well, that would actually <laughs> be quite fun. I know it we, would we be could fun. Clear, we could clear the field. Yeah, I know. Um, no, but look, um, I, I've, I, this is the honest thing. I love my life. I love what I get to do. And Candace would think the same thing. People are always trying to push us to run for things. Yeah. We enjoy the freedom. We enjoy the flexibility. We're a lot. We're around a lot of congressmen and senators. I just don't see them moving the dial at times. Do I you? don't. I think I think we're able to box harder from the outside. I mean, the yeah. stuff that I'm able to say and do, I'm not limited because. And I'm we can not go to London politics. and start Turning Point UK when we do That's stuff exactly like that. Right. You know. That's exactly right. But I, you know, but I will say I think that we both agree that we want to mimic the president when he was in his 20s. And someone asked him that question, and he said, "You know, if my country ever needed me, I would step up to the plate and I would run." I think we feel the exact same yeah, way. Yeah, totally. But it, do I have plans to get my whole life torn apart for a no. sport? Exactly. And and look, the we're we're in the culture war business right now and that's the most important thing. And being another R or D in a certain column, I'll I mean, never be a Congress. Person. Right. What what I, what I would what what interests me a lot more is changing, you know, the ideological predisposition of an entire generation towards their view of America. Like that right. really fascinates me and I, we're doing it. Like right. we're we're lit- and how many times Candace have we heard where people come up to us, we get messages, I used to be a liberal but now I'm a conservative because of what you, you have said. Yeah, we got so and when I when I hear and I see that, there's nothing more fulfilling than that. That's that's more fulfilling than running for office and winning. Right. To hear that once, we hear it thousands of times a year. Yeah, so do we a little bit. It's yeah, the best the thing. The videos are just so straightforward. So the conversion story is something that is so powerful. Yeah, so is there anything personal or private? What's your deepest, darkest secret? Oh, here we go. We're never getting No, we do. <laughs> what, what's back? like you have, yeah, you have to say something um, that like you don't want everyone to know. I'm but, allergic like, to just, gluten. No, no, you're not, Charlie. Stop ordering your generic salad. <laughs> See, I'm allergic to gluten. No, it's not. Um, Yes, that's my deep, I'm celiac. No, no, it's not his deepest, yes. darkest secret. Deepest, darkest secret. Um, I don't know. I have to think about that. Okay, so is there anything personally or professional that you were on one side at one time in your life and you switched over and went. Mine would be the abortion. And, and why? Yeah, talk yeah. about that. Yeah, I, I was adamantly pro-choice um, in my youth because the school system taught me that I should be pro-choice and they presented it like it wasn't. They would, in, you learn in textbooks that it's not a baby. 
Um, and, you know, it's not a baby until I think they'd say like three or four months sure. in health class you learn this. And they would show you stuff about, you know, how miserable a child's life was going to be if you weren't financially stable enough. So there's a little brainwashing that takes place. Um, and so I felt like in, you know, the whole my body, my choice. And like if the, the right thing to do is to not have the baby since you know it's not a baby yet, um, which is now I know is a bunch of crap and it's dishonest. And it's, and I obviously understand the abortion rates, but I was I was so pro-choice. I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't wow. like out marching for it, but I didn't believe that it was a baby at all. Um, so I, I want to do as much as I can to help people understand that they are being effectively brainwashed in school um, to disregard a human life. Yeah, they're marketing evil. They're, mar they're, 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 they're literally are marketing evil, evil, and it's very easy to market evil to a child's mind. Yeah. Mine would probably be, I remember being in, in middle school when the Iraq war was ramping up, and being this the solo conservative, I found myself having to defend the Iraq war. And I would always, oh, it's great and all this. And I've had a total transformation. I think it's one of the biggest mistakes in American history that we invaded a sovereign nation that was essentially holding Iran in check. Right. That we spent a trillion dollars, lost 5,000 American lives, and the country's worse off now than it was before we got into it. Right. And I, I think what it actually what it did is it allowed me to go on a path of maybe I don't have to agree with everything that Republicans and conservatives do, right. that we can think independently, that you can have your own viewpoints on things. And so that would be one. And I think you, you, this I, I could say the same for Afghanistan. I just I don't see the point in finding sen fighting multi-decade senseless right. wars for sand and death when our country's $20 trillion in debt, veterans come back with PTSD, and we're fighting over, you know, goat herder operations in northern Afghanistan that have no, no, uh, resonance at all to our country at all. Like what happens in Afghanistan right now, I don't see how that impacts right. us whatsoever. So that's something I've changed on. Right, I'm going to wrap this by asking oh, you okay. one question. Oh, and I always say to everyone at the end of these episodes, which is that if you could leave one thing on the table here that could launch a vibration, one idea yes, that you could leave to the entire world, what would it be? But here's the thing. You have two minutes and I'm going to stop you and the show ends right when I say Right. <laughs> Bub will stop you. You get two minutes Ready? to launch okay, a vibration. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. <laughs> no. no, I, 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 this is too much. This is like, <laughs> I, I, I need like an attorney or something for this. Like, <laughs> reading books yeah, no this is, is this is too much my whole my whole life has come to this moment this. This. their notes or something right, no, like no. i was i didn't come prepared to this um hold on hold on hold on hold on, hold on. i gotta get it hold on go okay hello people um <laughs> hello world hello world i'm supposed to leave a vibration for you right now um <laughs> can i get my two minutes back <laughs> okay here's the thing um the one thing that i would love to be released into the ether is um so so don't don't defend something um just because your quote unquote ideological or political team does it uh, i said this earlier but thinking independently thinking for yourself through a, a series of core principles um but i will also say this is that um the in modern day time right now there's an entire industry that is surround that is programmed to hate our president a lot more than love our country um, and that really bothers me. It bothers me in a variety of different ways because I see people that want to see the downfall of America just so that they could be proven right. And I never was that way under Obama. I wanted him to succeed every single day. I thought his ideas were horrendous and I thought his principles were very lackluster. But the, 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 the ether, what I want to throw into the ether now is for people out there, um, it's okay to support Donald Trump and it's okay to support a country that is vibrant and doing amazing because of his policies, um, even though you might disagree with some of his, his you know, his approaches or things, um, that you can break out of just the political paradigm that you're held hostage to and uh, think for yourself. Signing off, world. Excellent. See ya. <laughs> yes. was, that, was that good? I don't that know. That was, was good. That was good. You That's hit the good. timer. Good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.